Brothers and sisters, I invite you to take your Bibles and let's turn together for our scripture reading for our sermon this morning. We're going to be in Psalm 119. Psalm 119. And I'll read verse 97. Psalm 119, 97 says, Oh, oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. Father, we ask that you would bring your Holy Spirit sent from heaven to rest on the text to rest upon the preacher, to rest upon the congregation, and you be our teacher today. Help us to fade away and you to be all, front and center. Bless now, we pray, the preaching of your word, and use it for the purposes you've ordained for it. We'll give you the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. There are two sides to the Christian life. There is a public side and a personal or a private side. The public side consists of all those things that we are called to do with one another, with other believers, as brothers and sisters in Christ and as fellow disciples of the Lord. We go to public worship. We join small groups and Bible studies and Sunday school classes. We fellowship together. We eat together. We serve together. We do life together, practicing all those one another's that are laid out for us in Scripture. You cannot be a healthy, fruitful, mature Christian if you neglect this vitally important public side of the Christian life. We need each other to be good Christians. We are members of a body, a church, and the health of the body depends on the parts of the body working and growing together. But there's also the personal or the private side of the Christian life. Yes, there are things that you must do with other Christians to be a good and faithful servant of the Lord. But there is a realm of the Christian life where you have to do some things on your own. It's not enough simply to have a public relationship with Christ's body at church and lack a personal relationship with Christ himself. God has saved you and brought you out of the ignorance of sin so that you might know Him personally. You know, sometimes when people tell their testimony, they'll describe getting saved as that time when they met Jesus. Oh, I met Jesus however many years ago. And I've even heard that question posed before in Uh, by ministers asking people who want to join the church or by people who are trying to evangelize, they'll say, hey, when did you meet Jesus? When did you meet the Lord? But guys, salvation is not meeting Jesus. That's just having an acquaintance. (laughs) That's not what salvation is. It's not meeting Jesus. Salvation is knowing Jesus. There is a vast difference between meeting someone once and being friends with someone. You can meet a celebrity. That doesn't mean you're good friends with that celebrity. And if you try to be without permission, that's called stalking. (laughs) Right? We know the difference between an acquaintance and a friend, a good friend, a companion for life, a best friend, that person who's your person. The reformer said it like this, it is not enough for us to have known God once to have met Jesus. It's not enough for us to have known God once, but we must know him every day more and more. Knowing God more and more, growing daily in your knowledge of him, 
That is the personal side of the Christian life. It's the side that you must cultivate on your own in private. Yes, we need each other to cultivate our sort of corporate relationship with Him. And you can grow in your personal faith when you're around other believers. That's the point. But there's some aspects that's up to you to do on your own, just you and God. It's the side that you have to cultivate in private. Two greatest resources that God has given us as Christians, has given to the church to do this, to grow more and more in our knowledge of God, is daily prayer and daily devotions in His Word. That's why we have a Bible in English there for you to read while you're here and to go home and read on your own. It's the whole point of having a Bible in English in your language. Exposure to the Word of God only on Sunday mornings isn't nearly enough. If the only Bible you get is the short reading that Bill did and I just did, <laughs> it's not enough. Man does not live by bread alone, Moses said, and then Jesus repeated, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Your body needs to eat at least a couple times a day to stay healthy and flourish and grow and be in good shape and good order. You need to eat. You got you to have that nutrition, that sustenance. You have a soul that gets hungry. Now, it's not like your body. It may not have to eat every single day. And in fact, your soul can be pretty resilient. But eventually, the, the starvation sets in. You got to eat. You don't just live by bread alone. You live by the Word of God. And you need a steady, healthy, well-rounded diet of that Word. That's where prayer and personal daily devotions in His Word comes in to play. A couple weeks ago, we began looking at how to go deeper in our devotions. Our Puritan forefathers have taught us to practice daily devotions the way they had learned it from the Psalms. They taught us to practice biblical meditation. Biblical meditation. And based on the writings of the Puritans a couple weeks ago, I defined biblical meditation like this. Biblical meditation is dwelling on the Word of God in order to ponder the things of God so that you can do the will of God from the heart. Now, a couple weeks ago, shame on me, I left off the from the heart part of the definition. So go back to those notes and fix them. Say, Wesley isn't always perfect. <laughs> okay? Sorry to disappoint you. That from the heart piece, oh, it's got to be there. It's got to be there. Biblical meditation means dwelling on the Word of God in order to ponder the things of God so that we can do the will of God from the heart. When we practice biblical meditation, and especially when we couple it with prayer, our minds are renewed, our hearts are rekindled, our wills are reshaped. We experience the riches of God's blessing in our relationship with Him. We become more and more fruitful in the Spirit. We become more and more familiar with our God. We become more and more faithful in our obedience to the Lord. Christian, you cannot cultivate a well-rounded, robust Christian life if you neglect private prayer and biblical meditation. These two things have been the constant resource and supply of the saints who served God best, both in the Bible and down through history. If you want to see a strong and amazing, breathtaking Christian in action, go find that man, that woman, and say, What's your personal relationship with Jesus like? Tell me about how much time you're in the Word. Tell me about your prayers. And you'll see a person who is regularly eating and feeding the soul, nourishing the soul in the presence of God with prayer and the Word. Now, most of us are 
probably more familiar with prayer than we are with meditation. Now, I gave you a model a couple weeks ago when we talked about the Lord's Prayer. I gave you a model to help with your prayer life. And so this morning, I want to give you a model of biblical meditation to help with your devotional life. But first, I need to address a possible obstacle that some of you may have. And I touched on this a little last week. Some of you may be hesitant or resistant to try meditation because the word conjures up all these weird and undesirable connotations. But remember, biblical meditation is simply using the Bible to help you think about God deeply and stir your affections for Him so that you can live with more zeal and devotion for Him. That's all you're doing. It's not weird, it's not mystical and magical, and it's not even that complicated. It's just dwelling with God in the Word, stirring your affections for Him with that Word so that you can go out and live for Him with more devotion and zeal and dedication. That's what you're doing. Now, a related obstacle that some of you may have is that meditation is so foreign to you that even with the help of a model, it's going to be too hard or it's going to be too awkward or you're not going to enjoy it or it's, you're not really going to see the benefits right away. And so, I mean, what's the point? I just, I don't really know how to do it and I doubt that a model will help. So, it's probably not for me. Well, in response to that, I would say... I would just simply say this to you. You already know how to meditate like a pro. Everybody meditates. Everybody meditates. You do it every day, and you are very good at it. One author proved this point like this. She said, when people tell me they don't know how to meditate, I reassure them by asking, can you worry? <laughs> worry is the textbook example of the wrong kind of meditation. But meditation it is. What do you do when you worry about something? That little thing that you're worried about, or that big thing, or whatever it is, real or imagined. When you worry about something, what do you do? Ooh, it's, it's in there all day, isn't it? You just constantly turn things over and over in your mind. I'm worried about this, but the, what if it goes this way, and then this might happen, and what about this, and then I'll have to do that, and then, oh, this situation, and oh, but, but if that happens, then this will unravel, and then, and we just get tied up in knots because we start dwelling on, pondering, musing over, obsessing over, that thing we're worried about. And you experience, when you do that, you experience the mental, emotional, and even the physical effects of the thing you're worried about. Sometimes when you're worried about something in your head, you can feel a knot in your stomach. You feel emotions over that thing you're worried about. You keep dwelling on something and feeling more and more anxious about it when you worry. Who in here knows how to do that? <laughs> then guys, you know how to meditate. Everybody meditates because everybody worries. But we meditate in other ways too. When you have a song stuck in your head, it keeps playing on repeat in your mind. And sometimes you'll even catch yourself humming or singing it without even realizing it. You'll just be doing one thing and all of a sudden you'll just start blurting out song lyrics. You're like, where would that come from? You know? This happened to me yesterday morning as I was walking the dog. I took Daisy out the front door. Oh, it was just so overcast. It wasn't hot, cool, up there on the windy knoll where the breeze blows. It was so nice. Right. Windy knoll is the brand of ice cream they have at uh, September Farm, by the way. <laughs> Come tomorrow night to wing night and have some. I took Daisy out, and I was like, man, this is, I wasn't even talking. I was just in my head. Oh, this is so nice. And we're walking. And then out of nowhere, country road, <laughs> take me home to the place. Steve, to the place I belong. What, 
I have not thought about that song. I have not heard that song recently. And just out of nowhere, that's what was in my heart. <laughs> that's what was in my heart. And I just thought, what am I doing? Why is it? And then you know what happened? The rest of the day, every time I took the dog out, and then at different moments, West Virginia, Mountain Mama. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, right? That's how it happens. What was I doing? That was involuntary meditation. I wasn't trying to sing that song, I wasn't trying, but it was down in my heart. <laughs> That's what was in there. It was in the mind, tucked away somewhere, and for no reason at all, it just came out. <laughs> Okay, And that's part of why we sing psalms, to get a tune, to get a biblical tune down in your heart so that maybe, maybe, just maybe this week, you'll go, All your sins the Lord forgives, all your sicknesses He heals. He redeems you from the pit. His compassion He reveals. Maybe that'll get in your heart. And maybe that'll change your whole day. Man, your mind will be renewed if that stuff's just in there. Man, your heart will get rekindled if it's in there. That's all this is, guys. This isn't complicated. This is just getting the Word down in there and making it part of your mind part of your thoughts, part of your day, part of your heart, until your heart is warmed, until your heart is stirred. That's what we're talking about. That's what meditation is. And it's beautiful. And it's part of your relationship with your God. It's part of your friendship with your Savior. Psalm 1-2 that we looked at last time we were together. In your law I delight, and in your law I meditate day and night. And that word for medit that word for meditate there in Hebrew really does mean to like mutter to yourself, which is what you do when those song lyrics get stuck in your head. All of a sudden the little words start coming out and you just start muttering or mouthing to yourself the words that are in your heart. Don't you want God's words in your heart? So that when you face the day and things happen good things and bad things, or just normal routine, nothing going on, just a regular old day, man, God's Word is just in there, and it just starts coming out. Just make it part of your soul. That's what meditation is for, to get God and His Word as part of your soul and part of your day, and that will revolutionize the kind of Christian you are. Anything that you dwell on, anything that you obsess over, anything you just keep thinking about, and all the emotions that go along with it, that's what meditation is. Everybody meditates. The goal of biblical meditation is to get you to dwell, not on the worrisome things, but on God's Word, to obsess over the things of God, to have the Scriptures on repeat in your mind throughout the day. Look at our text, Psalm 119.97. I'll just read a couple verses from this. He says, Oh, how I love your law. I love it. I love your word, your law, your commandments. <laughs> oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. Your commandment makes me wiser than my enemies. For it is ever with me. Your commandment's always with me. That's right, because you're meditating on it. It's always with me. Verse 99, I have more understanding than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. Your intake of the Bible isn't just what you hear from me once a week, but you have a steady intake on your own. And when you do that, you might be wiser than me. That won't be hard. <laughs> I'm wiser than all my teachers. For your testimonies are my meditation. And then skip ahead to 103. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Is that how you feel about the Word of God? Is it sweetness to you? Through your precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. 
This is the key to sinning less and obeying more, to loving God more and loving the world less, to having the true God as the object of your delight and affection and not an idol that this world offers. The goal, to sum up this point, the goal is to bring your mind, your heart, and your will under the control of the Scriptures, to replace your worry with the Word, to let the sweet melody of Scripture be the tune you keep on humming. Meditate on your God, Christian, and stir your heart with the words of Scripture. That is what your private daily devotions are for. That is how you grow in your personal relationship with God and mature in your Christian life. And this model of biblical meditation that I want to share with you now is designed to take what you already know how to do, you already know how to meditate, and to give it some biblical content and some biblical structure. So let's get to the model then. The acronym that I've used for the model for the Lord's Prayer a few weeks ago was the English word pray, P-R-A-Y. Remember the acronym? You've been using it? Praise, realign, ask, and yield. Now the acronym today for this biblical model of meditation is not an English word. It's a Greek word. S-O-M-A. Soma. Soma. You're going to learn a Greek word today. Soma means body. It means body. It also means substance or that which is substantial. And I chose this Greek word for the acronym of the model because biblical meditation is the key to having a more substantial devotional life. We use the word body this way, don't we? So, ladies, when you have dry, straight, limp hair, ugh, which none of you do today. You look beautiful today. <laughs> Fabulous. I've never seen more beautiful hair than what you have today. So I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about other people. <laughs> but when you have dry and straight and limp hair, what do you do? Right? You use hair products that will do what? that'll add body to your hair. And when you add body to your hair, what are you doing? You're giving it that full, lush, substantial quality that I see before me today. <laughs> That's what this model will help you do with your devotions. If you use biblical meditation, this, if you use this model that I'm going to share with you of biblical meditation, you will add soma. You will add body, substance to your devotional life. Your private relationship with God will slowly, it's not a quick fix, it will slowly, over time, your devotional life will slowly, over time, begin to take on this full, rich substantial quality that will be so satisfying to your heart and so dynamic in your life. The Puritan Isaac Ambrose said this most powerfully in his magnificent book called Looking Unto Jesus. And it's basically a book about how to do this, biblical meditation. Looking unto Jesus is what he calls it. He said this, this is what Ambrose said. Looking unto Jesus will preserve the vigor of all your graces. Your graces are all those things that God's doing in your heart and life, all those gracious things He's doing to help you grow. He says, if you look unto Jesus daily, this will add vigor to all your graces. It'll invigorate your Christian life. And this is what he says. How many, this is in the 1600s, this is an old problem. How many, alas, complain of deadness and dullness in prayer because of their inattention to this duty. For want or for lack of this recourse to Jesus Christ, your souls are as candles that are not lighted, and your duties are as sacrifices that have no fire. Why aren't you on fire for the Lord, those of you who aren't? <laughs> 
What's the problem? What's lacking? It could be a lot of things, but one of them could be that we're not looking unto Jesus in His Word like we should. And listen to what Ambrose says about daily meditation, looking unto Jesus each day in His Word. Listen to what he says. Fetch one coal from daily from this altar and see if your offerings will not burn. Keep close to this fire and see if your affections will not warm. Sometimes we're not on fire for the Lord because we're not close enough to the fire. Draw close. Ambrose finishes by saying, Surely if there is any comfort of hope, if there's any flames of love, if there's any life of faith, if there's any vigor of dispositions, if there's any motions towards God, if there's any meltings of a softened heart, they flow from hence, from daily looking unto Jesus. So let's use this model to help us look unto Jesus each day. He will not light the fire again. Now this model, each part of this, all four points, are drawn from Scripture. I get them from the Psalms. This is not a complicated process. Just want to give you some direction for how to go about it. I gave some general advice a couple weeks ago. Let me give you some specific advice now. Letter S of Soma. What's the first one? Supplication. Supplication. Another word for prayer, for asking for things. You begin with prayer. Supplication. Before you begin your Bible reading, before you crack open the Bible or turn on the audio Bible or turn on the podcast that reads the Bible, whatever you do for your devotions, before you open up your Bible for the day, pray briefly to God and ask Him to open your eyes and your heart, soften your will, so that you can be totally receptive to all that He has prepared for you in His Word that day. This is how the psalmist does it. We don't have to leave Psalm 119. If we go back to 119, verse 18. Psalm 119, 18. This is how the psalmist prays. He says, open my eyes. Open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of your law. Don't think that it's just going to be automatic. We have to go before the Lord and say, Lord, I need you to open my eyes so that I can see what I'm reading and really see it. Open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of your law. Psalm 119, verse 18. And then you can skip ahead. Psalm 119, verse 33 and following, it says, this is how the psalmist prays. He says, teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes, and I will keep it to the end. Give me understanding that I may keep your law and observe it with my whole heart. Lead me in the path of your commandments, for I delight in it. Incline my heart to your testimonies and not to selfish gain. Turn my eyes from looking at worthless things and give me life in your ways. Do you hear how the psalmist is praying before he opens up his scroll, before he opens up his Bible? He prays and says, God, teach me, give me, lead me, incline me, turn me. And just go before God with that and ask him to prepare you to receive all that he has for you. That's step one, supplication. Number two, oh. Observation. Observation. After you pray, it's time to read. After that brief prayer, 10 seconds, 20 seconds, a full minute, it's not long, just asking God, open my eyes, open my eyes, open my heart, turn me towards your word, show me, reveal yourself to me, show yourself to me. After you pray that, observation, it's time to read. And you don't want to read just a verse or two. I would say read a larger portion. You don't have to be a whole chapter, but I would say read at least a paragraph or a section. If it's a short chapter, maybe read the chapter. But read a bit of a longer portion so that you can get a little bit of context and see what's going on in the passage. But just know that you're not reading for study purposes. This is not a Bible study. Okay? And it's also not casual reading either. You're not just reading it to get through it and get on to the next thing. Read more than one or two verses. Read a paragraph or a section, maybe, or a short chapter. 
read a section so you can kind of see what's happening. And now what are you doing? It's time for observation. It's time to start looking for stuff. Be on the lookout for something substantive to meditate on. You're not going to meditate on every verse and every word because it's not all the same thing. But you're, you're looking for something that you can meditate on. You're doing observation. And what are you looking for? You're looking for something to dwell on, to ponder. You're looking for the things of God or the things of Christ. The things of God or the things of Christ. Here's how uh, Psalm 77 Verse 12 says it. These are a list of some of the things we're supposed to be looking for so that we can meditate on it. Psalm 77, 12. I will ponder all your work. I will ponder all your work and meditate on your mighty deeds. So you're looking for things in the passage that talk about all the things that God does. Look for His wondrous works. Look for the things that He does, or what this says, His mighty deeds. So when you're reading your passage and you see God doing stuff, hone in on that. Be on the lookout for the works of God, the mighty deeds of God. Psalm 119, verse 15. I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. Verse 48. I will lift up my hands toward your commandments, which I love, and I will meditate on your statutes. Okay, so there's another thing to be on the lookout for so you can meditate on it. You're looking for the work of God, His mighty deeds. You're also looking for His laws, His rules, His precepts, His statutes. You're looking for His commands, His will for you. Look for the things that He does. Look for what He commands us to do. And then Psalm 119, 148 gives us something else to be on the lookout for. He says, My eyes are awake before the watches of the night that I may meditate on your promise. Oh, Christian, be on the lookout for promises. Note and mark the promises. His deeds, His command, His promises. And then one more, maybe best of all, Psalm 145, verse 5, last thing that you're looking for to meditate on. Psalm 145, 5, On the glorious splendor of your majesty... And on your wondrous works, I will meditate. Christian, be on the lookout for the glory of God. His glorious attributes, His character, His excellence, those things that are true about Him that are wonderful. Be on the lookout for these things. His works, His commandments, His promises, and His majesty, His glory, His beauty and excellence. When you're reading your Bible... Be tuned in and looking for these, the things of God. Or the New Testament, especially, looking for the things of Christ. The works of Christ, the commandments of Christ, the promises of Christ, the glory and majesty of Christ. Be on the lookout for those things. Observation. Supplication, observation. Number three, meditation. This is where we actually do the work of meditating. Meditation is number three, letter M. Once you have observed the things of God in the passage, it's time to dwell and ponder. It's time to meditate. Take those things of God that you've observed and then ponder them deeply in your mind and heart. Think about them. Get them stuck in your head and get them down in your heart. And as a prompt to get you started in this, I want you to try thinking through these three questions, just to prompt you. And once you start doing this, you won't need the questions. You'll just be doing it. And it'll just be automatic. But maybe start here with some of these questions. Pick a small number of things to observe. One, two, three. You don't need to observe everything you see. Just pick the stuff that stands out to you. The stuff that really like, ooh, I like that. That's one I want to focus on today. And just, you know, it's not legalism. It's not like rules here. It's just find the stuff that leaps off the page at you. Find the stuff about God and about Jesus. Pick a couple things and prioritize quality over quantity. You don't need to spend 30 minutes on 30 different observations. You don't need to spend 10 minutes on every, on 30 observations. You just need to pick a couple. 
and then spend some quality time meditating on it. So here's the questions you can use to get you started. The first question you can ask yourself is, what does God want me to think about Him based on this passage? What does God want me to think about Him based on this passage? If this is true, what does it mean? What does it mean if this is true? What must God be like if these things are true about God? Or what must Christ be like if this is true? Or what must I be like if this is true? And at Colossians, just as an example, Colossians 3.1 says, you have, If you have died with Christ, set your minds on things above where Christ is, seated at God's right hand. Oh, there's so much to meditate on right there. I died with, if I've died with Christ, what does that mean? Or, is, or is it, if I've been raised with Christ. If I've been raised with Christ, what does that mean? That means I was dead. And what does that mean? Dead in what way? Well, I guess I was dead in my sins. And what does it mean that he made me alive? What did he do to make me alive? And just, you see what I mean? You're just taking it and you're just turning it over and over in your head and you're just thinking about it. Just like when you worry about something, you think of all the scenarios of how it could go wrong. <laughs> Take that thing about God that you've observed and just think about all the things that are true about God. All it means for God to be like that. Take an example like God is omniscient. God is omniscient. He knows everything. What does that mean? It means He knows every thought that I have. He knows every fear that I experience. He knows every worry that I have, every trouble that I have. He knows every situation I'm in. He knows all the things I'll face today. He knows what I'm going through. He understands me. He gets me. There's not anything he's going to find out about me later that's going to be so horrifying, he's going to revoke his promises. He already knows all that stuff, and he loves me anyway. And just think about that. And all, all you're doing is just like dwelling on it, turning it over in your head, and then question number two. Question number two, what would it feel like to believe this with all my heart? What would it feel like if I believed what I just read, what I just observed with all of my heart? Colossians 3, 4. Christ, when Christ, who is your life, appears, you will appear with him in glory. If that's true, what does that mean? And then question two is, what would it feel like if I really believed that with all my heart? You see why you have to start with prayer? Because <laughs> we can't do this on our own. Take that truth that you observed and use it to stir your affections. Meditating like that and trying to get the truth down in your heart, it's like turning up the heat on the stove until the water begins to boil. Meditate until the heart begins to stir, until the affections begin to bubble, until your heart glows, until your heart is warmed with affections for your God and for His Christ. Question three. To help you meditate. How does God want me to live for Him today in response to this passage? Based on what I've just observed in the Word, how does God want me to live for Him today? What should my attitude and mindset be today? What would my behavior look like today if I truly obeyed what this says with all my heart? And just think about it. Use your mind to get the truth of God into your heart and then into your will so it's in your day. That's the goal. Last, last thing on the model. Uh, supplication, observation, meditation. Finally, application. Application. After you have meditated on the things of God, put your meditations to use. And I would say... First thing you can do is pray them right away. Remember that Lord's Prayer model? You start with praise. Take what you've observed about God and then use that to start praising Him. Just turn your meditations right into prayers. Just go right from meditation into your, using that pray acronym. Take what you've observed about God and then just go right before Him in praise and lift high His glory in your prayers. Pray your meditations into your heart, into the back of your mind so that it comes out during the day. Pray them right away. Reflect on them at different times during the day. 
Just let the Word be part of your daily mental furniture. And then when you face trials during the day, remember the observations you made. Use this Word when you face a circumstance or a situation. Take what you've meditated on and use it in your day to navigate life, to make decisions, to set your priorities, to treat others the way you're commanded to treat them, to be an obedient, devout, passionate Christian. Apply these things. And the more you do this, the more you'll have in there, and the more it'll just come out naturally. Biblical meditation starts in your private devotion time, but it should extend into the rest of your day as you live for God with devotion. The length of time that you do your devotions is not as important as the quality of the time you spend. You can do all this in 10 minutes if you're in a hurry. You could make this last 30 minutes. You could make it last an hour. Whatever, whatever you have the time to do, I would suggest trying to do it daily, at least once. Picking a time and sticking with it. Doesn't have to be, like I said last time, doesn't have to be sitting down in a chair. You could go outside, take a walk, go for a hike, ride your bike, do it in the car. You find the time, place that is comfortable and convenient for you. But add this to your day. And don't worry about how long you spend. If it's 10 minutes, hallelujah. If it's 30 minutes, praise God. If it's an hour, wow. <laughs> but just do some of it. Just do some of it. Start. Use the PRAY acronym and the SOMA acronym. And just watch what God might do. If you make prayer and meditation a daily part of your relationship with God, looking unto Jesus with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and if you use the PRAY model for prayer and the SOMA model for devotions, your relationship with the Lord will be deeper and stronger and more fruitful and more rewarding and more satisfying than ever before. I can speak from experience. May we be a church that is always looking unto Jesus, publicly with one another each week and privately in prayer and meditation each day. And may the Lord set us all ablaze with faith and love to live fully for Him with all our hearts. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the gift of Scripture, and we pray that you would help us to be faithful to that word that you've given us. Help us in our daily routines as we struggle and strive to deepen our relationship with you. Help us to love your word, to delight in it, and help us to begin trying this maybe new habit for some of us, biblical meditation. And I pray that you would indeed bless it deeply as we grow in our relationship with you. Let it change the kind of Christians we are. Let it change the kind of spouse or sibling or person we are. And let it change the kind of church we are. We want to be fully devoted to you. Help us to do these little things, these daily things well. And may you richly, richly bless us in our efforts to obey. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.